Actually, why don't we use this instead? Uh, Isn't it oh, nicer? You do whatever you want, man. Yeah. I mean, I'm asking you guys. <laughs> yeah. Maybe that's why I thought. <laughs> uh, that would work. Oh shit. How do I make it? Um Okay, and All right. Um yeah, why is JavaScript for my styling? Uh, yes, my first speak at uh, TalkJS with a JavaScript in this title. So sorry Hugh for that. <laughs> But um, yeah, before I started, uh, can we just together give a round of applause for Hu Jing and all the organizers for all the efforts about the, the four years? Yes. Yay, I got people clapping at my talk. <laughs> uh, yeah, um, my name is Eric. I'm a front end engineer at Rakuten Viki. And, uh, what was it? Oh, okay. Um, I'm very happy for my company to host this special event and also very, uh, my great pleasure to, to, to talk here in this special event. Um, all right. So now let me tell you a story. When I was in school six years ago, um, I met this girl through a school project. We together create a beautiful UI for our application. Though we didn't really meet after that, but I started thinking about her. I always, I always find this girl so special. In 2016, no, 15, I got my first internship as a front-end engineer. And that's how I meet her again. We meet every day, we work together, creating our own apps. And then, you know what happened next? We become lovers. She is beautiful. She makes beautiful stuff. She helps me make beautiful stuff as well. And she makes my life so much more colorful. I know, I always know that she is so special and, and she is so unique. And she was my motivation to go to work. But of course, no one is perfect. She's unpredictable and messy as well. <laughs> she throws her stuff everywhere she can. In her, in her room, in her wardrobe, in our living room, in a global namespace. <laughs> she puts her stuff in an order that, you know, sometimes doesn't make sense at all. But if you dare to change that, things might break completely. Right. Um, I was, I have a, a few good friends. We hang out together. She doesn't go well with them. So sometimes when we, uh, we, we hang out, I need to bribe her with, with some gifts. Anyone can guess what the, the gift is? Anyone? Okay, maybe you want to see my, uh, my friends first. <laughs> These are my friends. So now you know, I give her vendor prefix. <laughs> okay. Um, so my life just get harder and harder dating her. Until now, I'm still sure, I'm already sure all of you already know her name. Her name is CSS. <laughs> Man, I love CSS. <laughs> and I have to fix this relationship. I have to find new ways to, to love. So I could continue this love story forever, but of course my creativity is not, is limited. So let's talk things serious now. What is the problem with CSS and how we can solve CSS problems using a new friend, JavaScript? The first problem, global namespace. So yes, everything is global in CSS, right? I'm sure all of you have already seen this, a legendary tweet. Two CSS properties walk in a bar and a bar soon in a completely different bar falls over. The next one, a bit more aggressive, and yeah, it's already removed by Ken Wheeler. But yes, so you know that 
the bad things about global namespace. And we have all the good old solutions. And I'm sure all of you already know this as well. Block element modifier or some creation of a, of a previous generation. And this is uh, something that I kind of prefer. Reasonable system for CSS, which is like, which has a little bit better naming convention compared to BAM. And another one, another example is Inverted Triangle by Harry Roberts. Um, so all of them helps us to structure our, our CSS in a good way. But as Chris Coyle of CSS Tricks said, all of these, all these solutions help you to solve problem in a handshake deal kind of way. So your team must be very careful in, in terms of choosing your components. Um, you must be very diligent. Um, but of course, we cannot afford it all the time, right? And that, the solution comes naturally using JavaScript. Uh, and yeah, CSS in JS. So when we put our style in the component, everything is scoped under the, com under the component itself. So there's no global namespace. Of course, in the end, uh, most of the libraries will still compile this into like a no global class name, but it's already hashed to a unique class name. So you won't pollute that global namespace. The next problem is that code elimination. So how many of you have asked yourself, like, when you want to, to delete this class name, where do I use this? You need to search, you need to search um, your class name in your CSS file, in your JavaScript file, when you do DOM manipulation. And it can get even worse when you compose your class name using JavaScript. Something like you have a model, and depends on the class of it, uh, it depends on the state of it, you, you append the uh, double hyphen active to your model. So you have model active, right? But, if, but again, it's very natural. In CSS, uh, in CSS in JS, where you have your slide in your component, when you don't want to, when you want to get rid of your component, just delete and everything is clean. The next thing, the naming, not very fun. Also very related to the global namespace, right? Uh, I don't need, yeah, I think I don't even need to, to, to talk about this anymore because we all know about this. Uh, we, are, we have so many titles in, in, our, in our UI. We have so many like body, content, all of them, and you, we need to name it differently. And uh, again, using CSS in JS, this is how we, uh, we name our, like, uh, like our UI element. So we don't use class name anymore, but instead it's a component name, and it's scoped under the scope of your component. So you can have as many titles as you can. You can have as many wrapper body as you can in your code base without affecting each other. The next thing, sharing constants. Uh, when do you need to share constants? A lot of times. Like something that um, is very style specific, but you want to change it in JavaScript. And what do you do? You have to store it in both places. And every time you want to update, you need to update it twice. For example, uh, you have a page content that you know, stay like 50 pixels from the top of your page because your navbar is 50 pixel height. So how you, um, so that caused a lot of problem when updating and uh, changing your code. And of course, writing CSS in JavaScript, all you need is just a JavaScript variable, a constant, right? The next thing is critical CSS. Uh, it's kind of hard to explain this, but basically, with critical CSS, you want to just load all the CSS yeah, that, that you are showing to the users, right? And again, this comes very naturally out of the box with CSS in JS, 
when you only load your components with each styling. Um, of course, it's, it's made possible by JavaScript tooling as well, like code splitting um, and uh, some lazy loading stuff. But yes, you, you, you get it for free if you use JavaScript. And the last thing about theming. So um, now people are crazy about like dark mode, right? iOS just have their dark mode. Android also have it like for a long time, I guess. Uh, website support dark mode. And we also have dark mode in Viki. So the old way, <laughs> the old way we do it, there are two ways. Option one, you have a single overriding style sheet. We call it like dark mode dot SCSS when we use uh, SCSS, we, we use SAS. And then in, the, in there, we have a, like a super power CSS code that override everything that you have written with your line mode. And then number two uh, is you have an extra class name, like a, like a new modifier for your, for your block, for your element, for all the components that you have. But both create a lot of trouble for you when you want to update. And, and maintain your code. Uh, so, because explaining is, uh, theming is a bit hard, so I'm just gonna give you an example of how it's done using CSS in JS. Specifically, we are using a style component in this case. <coughs> so, uh, just wanna check, uh, anyone can see this clearly? Awesome. Right, so we, all we need is just a theme provider uh, that kind of inject the theme props to own the components that under this. Uh, I hope you are familiar with React and uh, JavaScript. But yeah, I won't go too much detail about this. But any, whenever you wrap your page or yeah, whenever you wrap your page with this thing called theme provider, you will have all the settings that you have you can look at this here. So I have a light theme right now. Um, the way I consume it, for example, I have a background color of my container. And then I use dynamic kind of styling to update my, uh, uh, my background color. And the, uh, and the way it works is uh, you are passing a function here. So every time you update your props, the function will be re-invoked. And then it updates your background color. Uh, let me show you an example. This is an example that I copied from uh, CSS in JS Playground by Dustin Straw, I think. So I don't know where to put the credit for him here. So, yep. Anyway, when you change the... Uh, how do I... Let me quit this, yep. So how you change the, ooh, what? When you just change the light theme to dark theme here, all the dark theme setting will be injected in your style and you have this. Um, and that's how easy it is. Because you're already familiar, you're working on a React code base or whatever, front end libraries that you are using. Um, so you know how things work in that libraries. You don't need to learn new things. You just need a new object and you pass it down using props, which is a very basic thing in JavaScript. And then you get the, your theming support. All right, now back to my... So that's the theming part. So uh, that's all the problems of CSS that we can use JavaScript to, to help us fix, including global namespace, dead code elimination, naming, sharing constants, critical CSS, and theming. But what else that are great about CSS in JS? Um, there are a couple of things that are not really directly uh, related to CSS, but we're gonna, I'm gonna mention it here. And from now on, I'm gonna talk about more implementation details that are specific to this library that I'm using, which is style component. 
The first thing is we can write actual CSS. So as I mentioned, we love CSS. I, I love CSS. I'm not sure about you guys. But, <laughs> but the cool thing about style components, or a lot of uh, Java, um, CSS and JS libraries out there, is, you, is that you can write actual CSS. So you use your, the syntax that you are so used to. There's nothing changed. All you, want, all you need to do is just wrap your CSS in a backtick with a style um, function from style uh, component. And then you have your, your component style. The next thing is that it's designed for the component age. Yes, so we are living in a component age. We, uh, we think of our UI as a, as a collection of components, like with a lot of like Lego box. So this is uh, a quote from Chantastic. If you're writing React, you have access to more powerful styling constructs than CSS class names. You have components. And it's not just true for React, it's true for all the front end, modern front end framework that you're using right now. Because everything is component driven, right? And this leads to the next, next point, is codify best practices. Uh, I actually didn't make up these terms. It's actually worked by Glenn Maiden, which is the co-creator of, of CSS module and style components. So what does it, it help us? It enforces component encapsulation. It removes the mapping between styles and components. So uh, you can imagine of that as um, when you uh, when you create a UI uh, components, you don't need to think about the implement implementation details of your representation layer anymore. Uh, for example, if you have a if you have a button with like a two uh, variants, the default one and the primary one, the way we used to think about it is, um, I want a primary button. I need to render a button, oops, with a primary class name, right? But now we talk, we talk to our components using components API. So we don't care about what class name it is. We just pass a props. And that's how we can abstract like, the implement implementation details away from our logic. And the next thing is also very important, separation of concerns. So a lot of people, when they first heard about CSS in JS. They say, no, I, I don't want this. I don't want to mix styling in, in my JavaScript. I was one of them as well. I was very against that. But then I think, again, we are, we are just exploring a new dimension of separation of concerns. So we used to separate by logic, styling, and the structure. But now we, we separate our UI by components. Instead of having JS, CSS, HTML, you have buttons, date picker, model, whatever uh, components that you have, right? So CSS and JS blends really well with this. OK, now I'm going to speed up a bit so that <laughs> I don't take much of your time. The next thing, yeah, we, we can utilize JavaScript tooling. We can do smarter optimization with all the tooling, auto prefixing, linting, minification, tree shaking, code splitting, all the cool words that they are always talk about in, in the JavaScript world, right? Now you can, you can use that, you can utilize that in your styling. And it's easy to migrate from CSS as well, because as I mentioned, we write actual CSS. So all you need to do is just copy and paste. It's also zero configuration. Um, all you need to do is just yarn install style components, yarn install emotion, whatever libraries you have. And it support gradual migration as well because it's so easy to, uh, to, to, to start developing your UI, right? So that's what, what's good about CSS in JS. But of course, it has some drawbacks. It has some costs. A co number one is performance costs. We have, because it's, uh, class is like compiled in runtime, so you, you, your, your browser needs to, to, to spend more time to, to like kind of 
compile and inject the style into the page. But you can see that from V3 to V4 of style components, and now V4 to V5, the performance just keep increasing really fast. So with this kind of uh, you know, improvement in the community, um, I'm sure it can catch up with CSS. Maybe not like even, but very soon. And of course, bandwidth costs. Yeah. Uh. <laughs> okay, uh, got it. Yeah. So, um, so it's not really big library. It's only like twelve K KB. But with twelve KB, what you gain, you can avoid loading on the, the CSS that you don't use. You avoid like even sending the, the request to get the CSS, which is render blocking at the first place. So this is actually a gain. And the next thing is not a uh, very happy depth tool because what you see is the hash class name. But with the support of uh, JavaScript tooling, like uh, I think, yeah, we, we have some tools that actually put your component's name out there for you so you can debug it easier. Uh, so yeah, again, why, why, why do we, why, why do I write CSS in JavaScript? Or the actual question is when should, when should I use it? Of course, it's, it's not a best solution for every case. You use it if your code base is large, if you have a component library, a design system in place, if you are facing all the problems that I just talked about, or if you create and kill features often because the dead code elimination will would be a big win for your, for your team. And the last thing, if you hate CSS, but of course, no way, we don't hate it. We love CSS again. So uh, that's the end of my talk. Uh, before I get back, this is some uh, shameless plug. I'm from Rakuten Viki. <laughs> we build a beautiful website, uh, a global video on demand platform focusing on Asian content. And uh, yes, we are hiring. I'm looking for my boss. So if any one of you, um, and my colleagues as well, so engineering manager, full stack engineer. So if any one of you are interested and have a friends, please uh, reach out to, to my uh, recruiter here, or you can scan the barcode. And yes, thanks, and see you again. Uh,